All right, so thank you for joining us, uh, Angeliki. Where are you calling from? Um, so I'm at my old high school, Mount Mansfield Union High School in Jericho. And um, this is this room, the, I guess the tech media lab room was converted into a polling station during the day. Usually they're across the hall in the library, but this time they were in this other room. Um, and I'm with all the volunteers, staff, clerk, clerk's assistant, um, board of civil authority. And they're all here doing that wonderful thing in democracy called counting the votes <laughs> and double checking everything. Well, thank you for joining. And I'm so glad to see, see all that action behind you. Uh, and so what kind of races have you been uh, watching today? We don't have any results yet because the polls just closed a couple minutes ago, but what have been the big uh, you know, ballot items or candidates you're seeing locally? I have to say this has been, as far as we're concerned in uh, public access, it's been kind of a sleepy local race because there's no contested house seats really um, and not a lot of contentious local issues, which I guess is a good thing. Um, but uh, there weren't debates or anything on, on you know, at a very local level. So it's been pretty quiet, but from what I hear from the clerks, there's been a really good turnout um, ranging from, I believe about 50% in Underhill of um, voting before the election to a really high number. It sounds like locally of 75% in Richmond um before even today so um they were i know here in jericho earlier in the day they were processing um in these fancy new uh vote tally machines behind me they were processing uh i think uh the the nearest days like the day before and the day before that they had caught up um on all the days up to that um and now i guess the hard work of processing all this uh, big collection of votes from today um, and it, it seems like it was pretty busy, like very early in the morning, and there was um, a nice trickle of votes throughout the day, a good turnout, um, even though there wasn't a lot of really heated local stuff, I think people were looking more at the national level. That's great. And I know this morning, uh, you and maybe some of your team, your staff went out to the polls to record you know, uh, some interviews with people at the polling locations. How was that this morning? Yeah, um, well, I guess it was um, relatively easy to find parking. So it wasn't like overwhelming number of people or like people went at different times during the day. Um, even here at the high school, the high school students were kind enough to park in other places than the front of the building. Um, yeah, so it, it seemed like it was like very civil and it was just quiet. Like there weren't a lot of candidates in front of the buildings, which we usually like to find an interview. There weren't a lot of issues in the hallways. Um, I guess it's just the midterm election kind of feel. Um, and it felt very peaceful and not heated and very Vermont-like um, sort of civic nature and people I happen to know locally from different parties kind of sitting side by side and chatting and laughing, I guess kind of idyllic Vermont voting situation in these little towns up here in Chittenden County. Well, that's great. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we end our short time together? Um, well, um, we did, you know, there was an interesting candidate um, in Underhill. We had uh, somebody running for governor uh, Peter Duval, um, who I heard over at CCTV in a discussion you had there said that he didn't feel like he had a chance of really winning, but um, he still was throwing his hat in the race just as a, um, uh, an effort to make sure that every single voice is heard. And I couldn't find him. I looked for him in Underhill, did not find him. Maybe he was in Burlington. Yeah, I'm sure he's around somewhere. It's, you know, sometimes hard to tell where people will be. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining and for this, you know, spending this time together. You're Can we welcome. see once more the poll, poll stuff happening behind you? Absolutely. And I'll see if the clerk has a minute or two to say something, if we'd like a little later. Awesome. Thank you. And yeah, hopefully we'll see if we can join with the clerk later. Uh, but otherwise, we're going back to the folks in the studio. Thank you again. Okay. So thank you for joining us. Uh, where are you calling in from? Yep, calling uh, from Burlington. Yeah. Glad to, you know, glad to have you on. So I know you work with the Vermont New American Advisory Council. You're the secretary uh, of the Vermont New American Advisory Council. Um, so I'd love to kind of chat about that. So as VNAC is working 
to build civic engagement for new Americans around elections. How do you feel that candidates, municipalities, and the media have done this election season to engage new Americans uh, in the process? Yes, um, thank you for that question. And I think before I responded, I wanted to just also um, say congratulations to all the winners. You know, I know the results are coming and also to all the voters because at the end of the day, they are the winners because their voices have been heard now and, and, and respected. And um, to your question, I think I will start by, you know, and how the candidates engage new American during the election season. So as you know, in late July, five Chittenden Central District Vermont Senate candidate, that's a mouthful, uh, you know, engage with uh, the Vermont New American Advisory Council to give their perspective and understanding on new American communities and uh, um, how also the support, what are also to understand the support needed regarding affordable housing, early childhood education, childcare, as well as their views about combating racism and promoting a sense of belonging you know, uh, for new American families calling Vermont home. I think that was, that speaks volume to that the candidates really want to engage with the newcomers and also the minority groups. Um, I think also the municipalities have done, an, an, you know, tremendous amount of um, work in order to translate the ballot items in collaboration with the Secretary of State. And I think the city of Burlington is currently contemplating uh, non-citizen voting uh, for local elections and the Charter Change Committee of the City city Council, you know, engage with the Dermot New American Advisory Council about the ballot language and the outreach mechanism needed to uh, make it happen. You know, and also you see another um, candidate such as Enfinet, who is a African-American, and he intentionally found new Americans to be part of his team, you know, basically up supporting him, supporting his candidacy, and I wish them all very well. Um, and I think, you know, over the years also the translated ballot items that we have done, candidates are, you know, showing up every single day to ask us questions, to engage when we call them for debates, they show up. And I think all of that is, is um, they have an intention to working with Vermont New American Advisory Council as we move forward and new Americans in, in general. But in terms of the media, I think everything that we have done so far, VNAC related, events and everything. We collaborate with CCTV Channel 17. You have been an instrumental partner around this work and we cannot thank you enough. But the only hope that we have is basically all the media outlets in the state of Vermont to look into you and to, you know, basically also try to engage the, the, just the way that you do it. It's genuine, it's clear, and this is just that you wanna build communities and doing so it requires including every single person. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, you know, on the media piece, you know, we appreciate the compliment and, you know, we're always, you know, really trying to be there for the community and support organizations like VNAC and, you know, definitely hope that, you know, that mentality can spread to other places. Um, and so thinking about, um, you know, what more can be done, do you think, to access, you know, the talents, uh, talents and experiences of new Americans and other organizations like VNAC in building strong and healthy communities? Absolutely. Um, thank you. I think that's a great question. What can be done more as we move forward? And I think the fact that understanding there are different uh, community groups who speak different languages, who have different cultures and try to engage them is one concrete example uh, that everyone needs to strive for. Whether or not you are a state agency, you are a municipal government, whoever you are, organization, philanthropists, you need to engage these people because they are smart, they are educated, and their perspectives also are unique in making this state the best place to live, work, raise children, et cetera. And I think people also need to stay away from using New American as an afterthought. You know, I think it will be important, I mean, from the get-go, from the beginning to include them in thinking about policy ideas in thinking about reform or structures. And I think their perspective are only going to diversify and, and increase also your perception about, about, about life, about well-being as well. I think those are concrete things that people need to be to build a strong, healthy community. The fact that we need to um, reach out to the new Americans is something that we need to strive for. I mean, if they are organized and trying to 
um, you know, come together and to build something, support them in any ways that we can. Mon mon monetarily, with, with resources, um, give them a space, give them a resources that they need in order for them to um, solve their own problems, you know, and I think doing it with a, with a community is, 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 is something great. And, you know, also look into, if you are an agency, look into your, 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 your staffing. Is it diverse? Does it represent the people that you serve? And if not, have an intentional goal in diversifying your staffing, you know, and also once you bring them in, also try to retain them, make sure that they are respected, they are supported in order for them to stay and be want to stay with you. And I think um, just let's all uh, understand that, you know, Chittenden County is, is, is the most diverse place in, in the state of Vermont, right? And uh, over 37% of the population growth in Chittenden County is composed of New Americans, right? And I think having concrete example programs that will support them to stay here because now there is a mass exodus of the New Americans going to all the states such as, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Utica, New York. And we have invested so much money in bringing them here and we need to do the same in, in keeping them here because they will only make um, the society, the economy stronger and, and healthier. Yeah. Thank you. And before we end our time, before we end our time together, is there anything else uh, you want to talk about that we haven't yet talked about? Um, you know, I mean, I think, thank you, Channel 17, for the work that you do um, in uh, building a stronger Vermont and a stronger county. I think just that. And uh, I don't know about the ballot item for the Burlington High School, but we hope that that's the best investment the community um, have done. And I hope that it will pass. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining. And um, yeah, we'll we'll be reporting on the results throughout the evening as we get them. Um, but for now, we're going to go back to uh, Jordan and Christine in the studio. Mm -hmm. Top five is the. Um, the proposal to amend the Vermont Constitution to allow for what the constitutional, to allow an amendment which would uh, read that everyone has the right to so-called reproductive liberty. I think in general that the intent of that Prop 5 was to protect Vermont and to protect women's rights uh, to terminate their pregnancies. And I do wanna talk about why I think it was put on the, uh, um, ballot and what its importance was. In the overturn of Roe v. Wade, many, many states saw the question of abortion in particular went back to legislatures, which then turned it into a matter of majority rule. And if in the legislature, the majority of the legislatures that voted to ban abortion, then therefore abortion would be banned and that would be from conception onward. And that did happen in some of the red states, including a place like Mississippi. In other words, abortion was banned from conception onward. Um, and that affected a woman's rights to terminate her pregnancy. And that is what was happening throughout the country. But many states like Vermont, knew that with the overturning of, Re of Roe, that the state should protect a woman's right to, to terminate her pregnancy. And so they began, we began to have constitutional amendments, which would include the right to so-called reproductive liberty. And what that means to me is a woman's right to control her pregnancy. It doesn't necessarily mean abortion, although it includes abortion, but it really is therefore a woman's right more than any particular medical procedure, but a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy as sort of a human right that all women and girls who are pregnant can exercise. And that's true in Vermont. However, because Vermont was worried that perhaps there would be some legislative ban on all abortions, this has now become part of our constitution. And I, I think it's going to pass widely tonight. There are certain concerns about it. Um, and I'm glad I'm talking about those concerns now after the vote is in, because I'm in favor of Prop 5. But there's a little bit of language there, which sh should concern people too. Will this include 
because part of it says that each person has the right to determine the course of their own life. In a Boston Globe article a couple months ago, there are some states that are uh, interpreting that to mean that maybe a child would be able to get so-called gender affirming surgeries to determine the course of their own life, maybe even without the uh, consent of the parent. That was of concerns among more Republicans who are uh, opposed to those, that kind of gender affirming surgeries and hormone treatment. Other people too were concerned. I'm also concerned about that. But the main component of that reproductive liberty was aimed at the attack on women's rights to terminate their pregnancy. And so I think that's the way most people think of it. Most people are going to, in this state, I believe they are going to pass, they're going to pass this overwhelmingly. And that's what I wanted to comment on because I thought the results would be in. There is a third concern, which I do want to speak to. In the language of that amendment, it also says something like, a, wo a, a woman has the right to determine her pregnancies unless there is a compelling state interest to restrict that right. I wanted to say how the Republicans argued, would argue those, I shouldn't say Republicans, I should say pro-life advocates. How they would interpret that is that there is a compelling interest to protect the fetus after viability. The compelling state interest, therefore, would kind of overwhelm a woman's rights to terminate her own pregnancy. In other words, the concern for fetal life would be paramount over a woman's life. And I'll just tell, and so there is a little bit of concern about that language of what is the compelling state interest. I would argue as a lawyer, that the compelling state interest on the part of the state is always, always to protect the life of the mother. And not, and that when the choice is to be made, the choice has to be made for the mother. And I'll give you an example, which occurred in Ireland. And that, this is fairly recent. In Ireland, all abortions were banned from conception onward. The Roman Catholic Church controls Ireland or did till recently. And because of that, all abortions were uh, banned. And there was in that constitution that life begins at conception and that the Irish government protects all life from conception onward. As a result of that, a woman in Ireland at 17 weeks pregnant, she was an Indian who was living uh, in Ireland, perhaps she was a citizen, became aware that her pregnancy was not tenable, that she would become uh, ill if that pregnancy continued. This was at 17 weeks and that maybe she would even die. Because of, the Vermont, of Ireland's law that said you can never get an abortion, she was denied an abortion and she died. So in other words, in my view, there is the main compelling interest at any stage is to protect the woman. If she's gonna die even in late term or her health is gonna be ruined even in a late term pregnancy, I believe that her interests come first over the fetus at any stage. In fact, in Ireland, what happened is that uh, because of that death, there was a big vote in Ireland after that 66% of the Irish population voted to legalize abortion after that case. And now Ireland, you can get an abortion. So this is a very important proposal. I'm anxious to see because there's such a battle also going on in this country about a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy. I'm very interested to see tonight what's gonna happen to Prop 5. I believe it's gonna pass heavily because Vermont has always been a pro-choice state ever since 1972. But in 1972, actually, I was part of a bunch of women who formed the Vermont Women's Health Center. That was prior to Roe, when the Vermont court said that there should be no ban on abortion, that doctors could be allowed after this case, it was called the Jacqueline R case, went to the Vermont Supreme Court, 
one law on the books against abortion, which was that a doctor could not perform an abortion that would be a felony. And that law was overturned. And ever since then, Vermont has had no restrictions on a woman's right to choose. So I'm hoping, I will be anxious to see this, what happens to Prop 5, uh, but I, I, I believe it's gonna pass, but we'll see, I guess. And that's what I wanted to say tonight. I was hoping we'd have results though, Jordan. So I'm anxious to see that as the results come in, okay? Yes, and thank you. And I'm also, you know, hopeful to see results soon. Um, and, and we'll be reporting that here on on the channel. But you know, I appreciate you taking the time, you know, to, to share with me. And um, you know, hopefully, we'll have our results soon to go yes, with thanks. it. Thank you very much, Jordan. Thanks for allowing thank you. me to do a little spiel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Lovely to see you. Have a good evening. Here are with Jessica Alexander, our town clerk here in Jericho, um, and something I used to send my absentee ballot when I lived abroad for many, many years. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Jessica, tell us what's happening tonight. I know you're busy. Right. So a few election, seconds. So it's election on? night, and we're um, the machine has tabulated all of our ballots. We have no hand count ballots, so we're happy about that. Um, but we're now emptying the machine, and we have to separate out Chitten and Solid Waste District ballots from general election ballots because they're going to get bagged separately. And the write-ins still need to be hand counted because they can't be tabulated by the machine. So um, we have a team that's separating the write-ins by race. So we'll, we'll count the first, is it US Congress, I think is the first race on the ballot. So those will get counted first. And if there's more write-ins on that ballot, it gets moved down to get counted in the second race. So, and I'm not gonna ask you any more questions because there's lots of volunteers here that keep asking you questions, but thanks for joining us. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> so I don't know, does it matter that it's 8.15 we're, and we're, we're still working? <laughs> it's dark outside. Yes, it's dark. <laughs> All right, so thank you. Bye. All right, well, thank you for joining me, Andrew. It's great to have you here. Uh, where, are you, where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm calling in from Sunderland, which is just a little bit south of uh, Manchester and a little north of Arlington. Wonderful. And I know you work with GNAT, uh, you know, the news director at GNAT, the Great Northshire, Greater Northshire Access Television Station. So another public right. access station in Vermont, which is wonderful. Um, so can yeah, you tell we... us a little bit about some of the local races you've been watching down there and if you have any results so far? Well, uh, yeah, they're they're about four local uh, competitive races we've been following. Three of them are, are for house seats and one is the county sheriff's race. Um, I'll start with the house seats. Uh, one in particular uh, was kind of interesting, uh, the, the Bennington Four district that includes uh, Manchester, Arlington, uh, Sandgate and a part of Sunderland uh, where I'm calling in from. Uh, there are two, it's a two member district. Uh, the two current incumbents are uh, representatives Kathleen James and uh, Seth Bonegarts. And they were challenged this year by uh, a Republican candidate, both uh, Seth and Kathleen are Democrats, I should say. Uh, they were challenged by a Republican candidate uh, for one of those uh, two seats, uh, a gentleman named Joe Jervis, who was from Arlington, uh, both Kathleen and uh, Seth are from Manchester. So. The only results I've gotten in so far uh, are from Arlington itself. And uh, I guess if Mr. Jervis was going to make a challenge out of the race, he, it would have been expected that he would have uh, performed perform strongly in his hometown of Arlington. But uh, the results I'm seeing show him in third place, uh, about 200 votes behind uh, both Kathleen and Seth. So uh, it's, it's not over yet and all of that. And the biggest vote uh, totals will be coming from Manchester. It's the biggest town in the district, but um, I, I guess that's probably not uh, what, mis what Mr. Jervis was hoping for, um, but we'll see. It's uh, still early, as they say. Um, the other two races uh, that we were following uh, pretty closely here was the district just north of that, uh, the Bennington Rutland One district. Um, that includes the towns of Dorset, Danby, uh, Landgrove, uh, Peru, and Mount Tabor. Uh, that's kind of an interesting district because uh, the incumbent representative, uh, Linda Joy Sullivan, opted not to run for re-election. She had served for three terms. Uh, it's basically been a Republican-leaning district uh, over the years. Um, since, since about 2000, uh, they, until 2016, they had sent uh, Republican candidates, including uh, Representative Patty Comline, who was a 
um, uh, a House uh, minority leader for the Republican Party. And before that, Walter Freed, who was the last uh, speaker uh, uh, of the House, was from uh, was from Dorset. Uh, then uh, Linda Joy Sullivan, who was a Democrat, uh, flipped that seat in 2016. Uh, but it's it's definitely uh, a district we could go either way. And so this year, two new newcomers uh, are running. Uh, one gentleman named Bill Giotti, who's from Mount Tabor, a uh, lifelong resident from, from there, and a newcomer, uh, Michael Rice, a Democrat, uh, was running. And no results in yet. Uh, definitely a, a race that could go either way. Uh, and uh, we had both of them into our studio for uh, a debate. Um, and that was kind of interesting. We had actually, we I should have said we had uh, uh, Mr. Jervis uh, and uh, Kathleen James and uh, Seth Bongartz in for a discussion also uh, in our studio, which uh, which is quite interesting, actually, uh, uh, got into an interesting conversation about the January 6th event, which Mr. Jervis had attended in, in Washington, although he's very careful to say that he hadn't gone into the Capitol or taken part in any of the uh, violence that took place. Uh, that day. The third race we're watching is uh, just to the south of us, uh, the Shaftesbury Sunderland uh, District, Bennington Three. Uh, incumbent David Durfee has a comfortable lead over his Republican challenger, Victor Harwood. I just saw some numbers on the Secretary of State's website, which indicates that Dave uh, is going to be, uh, uh, I think, comfortably in the lead. Uh, we also had them in for a discussion as well. Uh, the fourth race we're following down here is the Bennington County Sheriff's race, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the same uh, three candidates who ran, uh, well, not quite. Um, well, the same three candidates who ran in the primary, in the Democratic Party primary, are in the general election. Uh, the uh, the winning candidate in the Democratic primary obviously is in a race. Uh, one of the other candidates switched parties to run as a Republican, and another uh, switched part, but ran as an independent. Um, so it's kind of a replay of the primary in a, in a strange way. Uh, that that race attracted a fair amount of interest down here as well. Uh, the incumbent, uh, Chad Schmidt, uh, is not running for re-election. Uh, he became uh, sort of well-known because uh, there was uh, evidence to suggest that he had uh, been spending a lot of his time in, in Tennessee uh, and was sort of working remotely when that hadn't been agreed to in advance, let's put it that way. So that became kind of interesting. Um, so those are the ones we were following uh, pretty closely down here. That sounds great. And, you know, uh, glad to hear you were also hosting some debates or forums with candidates. I know that's something a lot of public access centers try to do really, you know, bring the candidates in and, you know, let them, you know, share their thoughts. So glad to hear that you guys are doing that as well. And so what about statewide, you know, keeping it brief, what were some of the statewide races that y'all are watching currently? Well, uh, I mean, all of them are interesting in one way or another. Uh, the one I found kind of particularly intriguing was Lieutenant Governor's race. Uh, again, we had uh, David Zuckerman and uh, Joseph Benning, the two uh, major party candidates into our studio for a uh, debate there. Uh, what struck me about that discussion was that uh, they were so cordial and friendly to each other. I mean, they got their shots in uh, and uh, didn't hold back any punches, but uh, uh, it was it was kind of a interesting thing to say to see in this current climate of polarization and uh, sort of general nastiness. It seems sometimes that they both had uh, really, uh, I think, a remarkably intelligent and and substantive discussion. What struck me as interesting about that is that. Uh, it would seem very likely to me that uh, this could well be, should Phil Scott win a fourth term tonight? And again, we don't know what the outcome of that race is gonna be, but uh, if he does win, um, polls seem to indicate that he's got a fairly good chance of doing that. Um, then the person who's in the Lieutenant Governor's seat obviously has a great, is in a great position in 2024 to run for the governorship. So I thought it was kind of interesting to see how that was gonna play out. And, uh, well, I guess we'll find out uh, later on this evening if it's going to be uh, Mr. Zuckerman's chance to uh, return to his old job or uh, if State Senator Joe Benning is going to uh, take that position. But uh, I thought that was kind of one of the more interesting races on the statewide level.
Yeah, I agree. And definitely curious to see what happens. And we'll be covering results here on Town Meeting TV, as well as many other um, public access centers are covering results as well. And so I'd like to end with talking about, uh, you know, GNAT and VAN. So the Vermont Access Network, uh, your public access station, GNAT, is a part of the Vermont Access Network. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that and how different public access centers uh, across Vermont are working together for election coverage and just, you know, coverage in general uh, this season? Well, I we've worked together with other partners uh, in the public access uh, network. Um, you know, we we've shared uh, our our programs and our our, our segments and uh, uh, things that we put out there uh, on uh, the Vermont Media Exchange, uh, and we've also uh, the, the candidate interviews. Um, and I think you know we've tried to do our bar, part to uh, you know um, bring bring more awareness and information to voters in our uh, in our coverage area, which is basically Northern Bennington County and uh, part of Western Wyndham County, uh, just to kind of give them uh, as much information as they could, uh, as we could to uh, help them uh, help inform their decisions when it comes to uh, going to the polls. And I think, you know, I think we, uh, we did our share. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining, Andrew. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us tonight. Uh, and we're going to go back to you, Jordan and Christine, in the studio. Well, thank you for joining us, Nick Carter. Uh, you're a Harvard Kennedy School Ash Center Reimagining Democracy Fellow, and we appreciate you taking the time to chat with us tonight. Um, tell me, like, what are some of the key things happening nationally, uh, specifically with Congress and the House and Senate control? Well, thanks so much, Jordan, for having me and also to the service that CCTV Town Meeting Television uh, provides. It's nights like tonight where I think people uh, are reminded of the value of local media uh, and and the services that uh, community access provides. Um, you know, it's really remarkable when you think about it, um, the number of candidates, the number of ballot initiatives that are on uh, the ballot this year at all le levels of government. So ranging from control of the United States Congress to state voting rights to marijuana legalization, uh, there is quite a lot going on. Um, and according to the United States Election Assistance Commission, there's somewhere in the ballpark of 176,000 voting precincts or equivalent precincts across the United States. Uh, and to make things even more interesting um, is the decentralized electoral system. So um, voting rules being decided at the state, county, town, uh, city level. Um, and so having very different voting rules and systems uh, in very close proximity uh, makes for some really interesting uh, dynamics, um, but it's also a testament to election officials, town clerks, uh, volunteers and others who make this uh, wonderful process actually uh, actually work. Um, and, and frankly, I think for the most part, it's working pretty well. Uh, certainly, uh, there are concerns from across the political spectrum about uh, issues with the voting process, intimidation at the polls. But I think most voters are expecting uh, that their vote will count and that they'll be able to participate in the electoral process. Um, so obviously everyone is gonna be watching uh, what happens with the US House and the US Senate, where Republicans just need to pick up a net five votes to take control of the US House, which they're highly expected to do. Um, and for a variety of reasons, historical trends, uh, the president's approval rating, uh, the economic condition, um, and you know, obviously that hasn't been called yet, but uh, very, a very good reason to think that's going to happen. And then the U.S. Senate, uh, Republicans will just need a, a net one vote uh, pickup to take control of the U.S. Senate. And so uh, poll uh, election watchers are watching very closely the outcomes of uh, the U.S. Senate races in Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Pennsylvania, uh, Wisconsin, and even in next door uh, New Hampshire, uh, where Maggie Hassan's reelection has gotten much closer, especially over the last couple of days. I, I think it's important that people keep in mind that in some of these really close contested races, uh, we may not know the results for a couple of days. As uh, ballots come in, as results are challenged, uh, you could expect a, a slew of legal challenges in a few of these races. Uh, so it's you know likely that we might not actually know uh, who's going to control uh, the U.S. House or the Senate uh, for a couple of days, leaving many, many folks anxious. 
Um, but additionally, you also have uh, some really interesting uh, and important statewide races. Uh, if you think about Arizona, uh, not a lot of similarities with the Senate states, but not entirely. Um, so Arizona uh, is one where you also have a very competitive uh, gubernatorial race, uh, Secretary of State, Attorney General. Um, go up a little bit to Oregon, where you have an unexpectedly close uh, governor's race. Uh, next door in Nevada, uh, also U.S. Senate, uh, but also a very closely uh, contested uh, governor's race, as well as Secretary of State. Uh, and then moving more to the Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, uh, where you have really close uh, statewide races, uh, which will have real implications on a variety of policy issues, uh, but also um, voting dynamics going into the 2024 presidential election. So the stakes are, are extremely high. Uh, lots of uh, energy and focus has been spent on those states, uh, and we'll see we'll see what happens. Um, and lastly, um, not only do you have candidates uh, running against each other, you also have the democratic process and electoral process itself on the ballot uh, in a few in a few places. So this range from the town and city level. So for example, in Portland, Oregon. Voters will be deciding uh, a ranked choice voting uh, proportional representation system uh, for the city of Portland uh, next door in Seattle. Uh, voters will be deciding between a few different approaches to elections, uh, approval voting, ranked choice voting. Um, and then statewide, uh, you have a, a voter ID ballot initiative uh, in Arizona, uh, as well as a ballot initiative in Michigan to expand uh, voting uh, options. So not only is it candidates that are being decided, but the process itself is is on the ballot in many places across the country. Um, so those those are some things that I think uh, a lot of folks are, are going to be watching tonight. And you know these will have immediate implications for uh, the many more elections that will be happening in states and communities in 2023, and then of course um, impacting the next uh, presidential election in 2024. And so also there are items on the ballot uh, nationally. Uh, can you tell me about some of those ballot initiatives and different things that people uh, should be watching for? Absolutely. So there's a, there, there's a range of issues ranging from tax policy to um, abortion rights um, to voting rights. Um, the voting rights is where I've been specifically um, focused on. So for example, in Arizona, Proposition 309, um, which essentially relates to uh, voter ID in that it requires uh, birth and government identification number for people voting uh, by mail and, and creates new requirements um, to participate in, in the vote by mail process. Um, you know, in Arkansas, interestingly, you have something that is more uh, related to uh, the threshold necessary for uh, for ballot initiatives, so raising the threshold to uh, sixty percent uh, in order to move a ballot initiative forward, um, and then prop, uh, proposal two in Michigan, this would create a nine day early voting period with drop boxes. It ensures that military ballots uh, are counted if postmarked by election, and um, allows for an affidavit instead of ID for in-person voting. Um, there's also some provisions to protect against harassment uh, at voting locations. So uh, that just gives you a range of the, uh, the types of democracy-related ballot initiatives that are being decided. Um, you know, and additionally, uh, it even gets further uh, granular. So, for example, Dane County, Wisconsin, has a ballot initiative specifically for that town. I'm sorry, for that county. I don't believe it's binding, but it, it essentially gives uh, a recommendation to the state legislature around uh, marijuana legalization. So, even just at the county level, uh, voters will be deciding specific ballot initiatives, as they're doing uh, as well in the state of Vermont. And just kind of to, to wrap it up and, uh, you know, is there anything that, you know, you think is really different from this midterm election compared to, you know, the other elections and how does it compare to prior years? For, for good or for bad, I do think more people are recognizing the importance of 
what happens in between presidential elections. Um, and there's much more of uh, an awareness and enthusiasm. I do think turnout is going to be high. I think it's going to be high for all parties. Um, so I'm not sure if you know high turnout is a guaranteed win for either side. I think you're going to see high turnout across the country. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about the next year in 2023, that there's going to be plenty of municipal uh, elections in cities and towns. Uh, you're going to have special elections. Um, and, and the realization that democracy is very much uh, a 365 day uh, all, all, the, all the time uh, activity. And I think that's something that is different about this cycle. Um, and so uh, I guess we'll see what happens. We will see what happens. Thank you so much, Nick Carter, for joining us. Um, and we're going to go back to Jordan and Christine in the studio. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin, for joining us here uh, to talk about you know the election and the election results we're getting in tonight. Uh, so where are you calling from? I'm calling from Waterbury, where I'm doing some other election analysis on WDEV. But uh, it's great to be with you. Yeah, really appreciate appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, so what are some of the state races and some of the local races that you've been watching this evening? Well, obviously, the election of, uh, of Peter Welch to be the next U.S. Senator from Vermont, replacing longtime long Senator uh, Patrick Leahy is somewhat historic. And then there is the uh, the election of Becca Ballant to be the first woman uh, and a gay woman to be uh, Vermont's lone member of Congress in the U.S. House of Representatives. That is truly historic. And um, and uh, she, both uh, Welch and Ballant won overwhelmingly. Um, and then Governor Scott, Phil Scott, has won uh, convincingly as well uh, it, it, with a wider margin than I had thought. Um, and so uh, those are those are the early ones that one of the local races that I'm keeping my eye on is uh, down in Orange County. Uh, there's a spirited challenge by a guy named John Clark against a longtime incumbent, Mark McDonald. Uh, McDonald had a stroke recently and couldn't campaign. Clark is way out to the right. Uh, is something of an election denier and has gotten involved in a in a debate over transgender issues at the local high school. So, um, you know, we're all looking to see whether election denialism on the national stage infects Vermont at any level. So far, it seems not to have. And now at this point in the evening, you know, we're starting to get results. What are some of the trends you're seeing with these results and how do you think they're impacting uh, during this midterm election? Phil Scott is winning a fourth term by a very convincing margin. Uh, right now, sort of, sort of 70, some, 70 plus to 20. And that surprised me. Um, the lieutenant governor's race featuring uh, David Zuckerman, a longtime Chittenden County Senator, uh, former two-term Lieutenant Governor, ran for governor against Governor Scott, lost badly two years ago, is, is now seeking his old Lieutenant Governor's position against popular and well-respected Republican Joe Benning, not an election denier, but one of the more, uh, I would say, moderate Republicans um, that still exists in Vermont and New England. Uh, Zuckerman's ahead by 12,000 votes at this point. And it's, it seems like that's just too much to make up for a, a guy with Zuckerman's name recognition and record in Chittenden County. And is there anything else overall that you think has really been either interesting or surprising, you know, this election? Well, again, I, I, I got to say, you know, a tr there's a tradition in Vermont that when a governor is running for a fourth term, whether it was Howard Dean, whether it was Jim Douglas, um, you people get tired of governors after after six years. At least that's been the pattern. Uh, 
the 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 strength and durability of Phil Scott's reputation in this state in a hugely democratic state. I often call Vermont the most liberal state in the country. Um, there is little to no evidence that Trump and MAGA uh, politics are infecting our politics yet. Uh, it was tried. It looks to be failing. But uh, so therefore, a Republican like Scott re uh, retaining this kind of popularity, I got to say, is surprising to me. And I, I got to give Scott all the credit in the world. I mean, a, a Republican running in a hugely Democratic and liberal state, it's a real testament to the reputation that he's built and his record. Yeah, you make a great point. Uh, is there any last last thoughts or last comments you have as we kind of close up our time here together? Well, I I think we all have to take a moment and recognize the achievement of Becca Ballant. Um, there's an old saying in politics that, at least in Vermont, that it's really hard to run as a state senator or a state representative uh, and then run statewide. Uh, Madeline Kunin ran once and lost and then won the governorship after that. Um, it's often said that you have to run statewide and lose in order to win again. Becca Ballant, first time out of the gate uh, from Brattleboro, southern part of the state. She is going to be the first woman uh, to represent Vermont in Congress, in the Congress of the United States. It is truly historic. It is well earned. And um, you there's nothing you can take away from her. She was an excellent candidate and she won this race, both the primary and the general election going away. And uh, look out for Becca Ballin in the future. She is going to be a force to be reckoned with. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us, you know, to, to talk about some of the election results we're seeing and what we're seeing across Vermont. We appreciate you taking the time. 